All right. All right. So here we go. Welcome. So this is the first podcast for Aquarium Insider. I'm going to shoot this a, two, a few times, by the way, Jay. I might do a couple yeah. like intros myself. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so welcome. Welcome to our first podcast. This is the Aquarium Insider Podcast with me, Dan Connor. And today I'm super stoked. We're going to be uh, talking about setting up your first aquarium. And I've got a cool guest with us today. This is Aquafunk Aquatics. We're going to be going kind of have like a little conversation back and forth of, you know, things we wish we knew when we set up our first tanks and uh, go through maybe some myths, maybe some truths at the end of uh, some common, uh, common, uh, things out there and i guess in the aquarium world is a good way to put it so let me let jay kind of come in and introduce himself real quick jay tell tell everybody about yourself man how you guys doing my name is uh jay i go my um channel name is aquafunk aquatic so most people call me aquafunk or aqua or funk either way it doesn't really matter what you call me as long as you call it me in a friendship um i've been in the hobby um since Huh. Honestly, I've been in the hobby since 2000 when I started working at LFS's pet stores. Um, I, I didn't really have a whole lot of experience before that. I, I, I started out with reptiles, um, but being at a, at a pet store, reptiles and aquariums are always right next to each other. And the customer don't care what department you're in. They want help from somebody. So I had to learn fish. And uh, um, I, I was on and off. And uh, over the last five years or so, I started going real heavy, um, specializing in the angels, central, and South American cichlids. Awesome. Yeah, so um, I guess what I wanted to kind of help keep structured around the podcast today is I got a few questions when we're going through, you know, here at the shop, we get a lot of questions, you know, we want to set up our first tank, what kind of fish go well, what do we need, that sort of thing. And a lot of you know, a lot of the places they're getting information of may not be that good. So we kind of wanted to talk about today those sorts of first questions. So, Jay, I'm going to start you off with a question. You let me know, and then I guess I'll, I'll kind of respond after you if you're good with that. Um, yeah, sure. Go for it. All right. So first question is, I guess, what do you th – um, what kind of – I guess well, – let me start this over real quick. So setting up your first tank, what do you think that first question – that person should be asking themselves like what what do they where do they start what is the first thing you think before they do anything else what's the what do you think they should be asking themselves first okay so in my opinion um from my years i like i said i worked at lfs's um i was a beginner at one time and i i continue to continually speak to beginners um in a hobby i think the very first thing you have to ask yourself um it, it is when you're talking about setting up your first aquarium is um, basically what is it that you're trying to get out? Of? You know, like, is it aquarium for the house? Is it aquarium just for you? Like, you know, there's a lot of times uh, men are probably the worst at it. Um, well, they'll be like, yeah, I want to set up an aquarium for the house when really they want aquarium. you know, they're going to be the ones making all the decisions. They the ones that want it. They the ones that push the issue. So if it's going to be for you primarily, you need to figure out, what fish is going to fit your situation? What type of fish you want? You know, most most people, they 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 automatically go for community tanks, um, and I've learned that that's not always. In fact, that's rarely the best way to go, in my opinion. Um, is a community tank is not always the best way. Yeah, definitely. I was just I was gonna echo that. I was like, look, I was just looking through the questions. I'm like, let's let's first start with the fish. What kind of yeah. fish do you want to keep? Do you want to keep things that are you know super active are you looking for something that might be a little bit more aggressive maybe some sort of biotope or you know maybe everything's from the same sort of region you know kind of have those sorts of questions kind of nailed out and then kind of proceed yeah. with what size tank you you're gonna get if that makes sense exactly like for instance for me if i was starting up my first tank i would give myself the advice what type of what what are you looking for in a fish? Are you looking for a whole bunch of little teeny weeny fish, you know, because you can get guppies? Are you looking for a fish that you can react with? Okay, well, you know, now we're talking about a cichlid. Um, once you kind of nail down the type of fish, okay, a medium sized cichlid. Okay. Now now you have to ask yourself, what can you afford as far as tank goes? 
Okay, so I could only afford a 55 on sale. Okay, well, a good cichlid for a 55 on sale, if you just wanted one fish in there, uh, Jack Dempsey. You know, um, it has aggression, it has personality, it has coloration, it has size. So that's that. I think that's where people make the biggest mistake. They automatically go for community, color, and diversity, when really that's not what they're looking for. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's a, some good points, and I kind of want to piggyback on that a minute with kind of the leading to the next question, and yeah. and uh, so the question is, do you think sh tank shape matters? And I'm really speaking to the long versus the tall tanks versus the hexagons or the bow fronts, meaning do you think there's a tall versus a, a long tank really matter for those types of fish or any type of fish really? Do you think it matters? Well, I, I think it definitely does. For instance, I, you know, I'm a big angel fish um, dude. So a tall tank does mean better, you know, so um, a 55 would be better than a 40 breeder. You know, um, whereas a 40 breeder has a great footprint and very diverse um, in what you can do with it, a 55 has the height that I'm looking for. Um, it's all about the type of fish you have, you know. Um, if I got a 55 and I would happen to get a fish that just happens to be long, you know, like that needs a lot of turning room, maybe a 55 wouldn't be as good than a 40 breeder because – you know, it does. It, it's a long fish, so it, it just depends on the fish you get and the requirements. Yeah, yeah, and uh, kind of talk a little bit about that. You know, we have a lot of people that come in. You know, to our shop here, they like African cichlids. They're like, "Well, I want to, I want to do, uh, I want to do African cichlids." I'm like, "Well, what kind?" And they're like, "Well, I don't, I don't know. Just ones that you know got a lot of color, and that's you know that means a lot." And essentially, what's a good thing with that is, I'm sorry, not a good thing, but uh, I try to ask them, "Do you want?" fish like these and I'm pointing at, you know, normal Mabuna peacocks or I'm sorry, Mabuna yeah. Africans, you know, a lot of stuff from Maui and then haps, you know, and other peacocks like that. Cause those yeah. traditionally need two different type tanks. You know, the 55 I find yeah. pretty good for the Mabunas cause they like to be around rocks and structures and they're in and out. When you're starting to do those bigger peacocks that are getting up there in size, you're going to need a 75 at least. So they got some room to kind of swim around that structure. They want to yes. go more open yes. and, the tank and they, they tend to do better in those types of situations. So that's, you know, something to just to consider, you know, swimming room, I guess would be a good, a good yeah. thing. Cool. Well, well, not only that is if, it, if you plan on having multiple fish, um, not only is size of the tank important, but another thing that people don't think about is if, for instance, um, like, like, like we're talking about, like just Mimbunas, I noticed, you know, the, the the decor that you can put in a Mimbuna tank can also allow you to have more Mimbuna. You know, like if you if you drag the rocks up the back of it, you know, it would give them, you know, basically the back and the bottom to kind of, you know, swim on that structure. Whereas if it was like a 55, you just have rocks at the bottom, you know, they I, I feel like it, it would it would be as conducive to have a mul multiple fish in those tanks. So um for me once you find, like you like we said, once you find a fish, you know, then you decide on the tank. So that's, and, and you know, it's all about the fish. It's all about what you expect. What are you expecting? And you have to be honest. A lot of people are not honest about the fish that they want because they don't know. They haven't been around a whole bunch of different types of fish to realize, oh, no, I don't want an Oscar. I want a several, but they don't know the difference yet. Yeah. And that's, and that's part of like, I think in the beginning doing that sort of like due diligence, that research and be like, look, I really, really dissecting the types of fish and where they might be coming from and, and what tank mates, you know, essentially would be going with those fish. And that will, I think hopefully, you know, there's enough information out there. They can make a pretty good decision at least to start with. Mm -hmm. So that's good. good. Okay. So tanks we talked about that a little bit what is your favorite type of filter for a fish tank okay so in, in as as a as a um, i hate to use the word experience but someone who's been doing this for a little while honestly my favorite type is the sponge filter but for a beginner um a sponge filter is is 100 reliant on you understanding beneficial bacteria Hmm. Um, which most people starting out 
don't really understand that yet. So hang on the backs for a first timer um, is the best way to go. I don't suggest using a canister at all for a first timer. Uh, canisters, definitely. I have a problem with. They're they're one of those things where they're out of sight, out of mind. You you don't clean them as much as you should. Um, you know, it's it's the hang on the back allows you. Okay, so the hang on the back, HOB, so the traditional ones that you know hang on the back of your tank. The thing I like about them for beginners is a lot of times, if it's a good one, um, they have distinct separations of biological, um, mechanical, and fil- and um and um and chemical. They have a distinct difference. So you can see the levels of a proper filter. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and it's easy to maintain. You know, but um, my favorite would be um, sponge filters and water changers. Which, yeah. You know. Yeah, so we were looking, uh, I was looking the other day at a few filters and, you know, definitely if, if you're just getting the hobby, looking instead of a fish tank, I'd I definitely would think hanging on backs are going to be easiest. I don't think they're all created equal. They all have some are, some are pretty good. Some are not very good, but I'll tell you this, Jake, cause we were talking about the other day for, for like the best overall possible filtration on a hang on back. I pulled that title from uh yeah. Kim, the title 55 and put it on my 55 and from the layers of how you can tell where the bio filter is, where your pads are yeah. going to be. Um, yeah. so, to give you a little background, this filter has a much bigger compartment in the back. And when you think about it, the bigger the compartment, essentially the more filtration your tank is going to be getting as long as the water flow is 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 active, right? You've got enough water flow pushing through there. It's got a, a, yeah. uh, a little, uh, not really a switch, but like a little knob where you can turn down the water flow and adjust it properly for your tank. And from a from like a out of the box, you know, best filter out I think that makes it, you can take, I think any hang on the back and make it better, but you just got to yeah. keep in mind, you know, when you're setting this tank, your filter should have a biological filtration component, something that you're probably not going to be removing out of, out of the filter. Maybe, mm-hmm. um, you know, a lot of them are going to come with those. All they're going to come with is maybe like a little carbon insert, like a little yeah. filter pad that plugs in. It's got carbon in it. And I think, you know, there's a few little modifications you can make to them, you know, to make them a little bit better filter for than just the stock that comes with it, I think. Um, but definitely, as long as it's got the space for the different levels of filtration, um, I think it makes it easy easier for, you know, someone just set up a tank to, to get and uh, make it work a little bit more effectively and efficiently, if that makes sense. Well, to be honest with you, like you brought up the title. Um, I have one. I actually haven't made the video on it yet. Um, hmm. But there's one thing about the title that stands out. And I'll, I'll get to that. But but um, as far as beginners go, um, the number one te- the number one filter that they're going to probably run across and it's going to be pushed on them, the two of them would be like the Whisper because of the price yep. and the Aqua Clear because for... Up until recently, with the title, the Aqua Clear was like the king, um, hang on the back filter. Um, and that's a good filter. Whisper, that's that's a great filter it, too. It, it is, and like I said, you can distinctly. So when you're trying to learn about the um, the uh, the the bio the um, nitrogen cycle and biological filtration and filtration in general, you could see the the you can see okay, this is biological, this is mechanical, this is. Um, the Whisper does not have any of that, but what the Whisper does have that I really, really like, not all of them do, some of them don't, is they have the pump in the water opposed yeah. to on the back of it. So if you have a power outage, the the Aqua Clear or the traditional hang on the back with the actual impeller outside of it burns up because there's no water in the filter. Whereas yeah. with the, um, the um, pump being submerged in the tank it automatically fills the filtration and it doesn't burn up that's why i'm impressed with the title the title right. has the the impeller submerged in the tank so if you do have a power outage which a lot of people don't think about power outages with their first tank there's yeah. a couple of things that happen one is you your filter runs empty because of the momentum of the water um and it and most a lot of these filters 
say they prime themselves, but they struggle depending mm. on the, how how much water you have in your tank. If your water is too low, that pump is not going to be able to do it. Yeah. Um, uh, another thing is, you know, air 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 hoses. But as far as filters go, having the impeller, the actual pump, submerge into the tank, submerge in the tank, I feel is a huge advantage um, opposed to like where the aqua clear where it's on the outside and, and it get hot and burn up. So yeah, that's one thing. And I wanted to touch on something. I actually want to backtrack one second on this filter is in your, in your words, your terms, what, what is a biological filter and why do you think we, you know, Aquarius need it? Cause I think that's going to be something to be like, what, what is it? What do you mean a biological filter? Cause if you're new, okay. you probably wouldn't know what that is. Yeah. And I love that you asked me this question and I love explaining this question because I feel like, a lot of people make it so difficult for people yeah. to understand. Okay, so um, biological filtration, it, it's, it's a bacteria, it's biological. It is in your water, it occurs naturally, wherever, however, it, it's, gonna, it's gonna go on the side of your tank, the glass, the, the plants and all that. It grows this microscopic little, like a Pac-Man. That's how I always think of it. Pac-Man. All they do is eat. Well, um, it eats up all the toxins coming. With, it's ammonia, but basically, you know, the the dying food, the dying plants, the dying fish, um, the dying poop, the poop, all that dissolves. It's it's toxic to your fish. These little Pac-Mans eat it up. Now, <laughs> even though they're they're every, I mean, that's the best way. All I, 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 I love it. I, I literally head. love it. It's it's awesome. I love that example. Yeah. So even though that those my, those um beneficial bacteria are all over the tank, it really can't do its job properly unless the water with the toxic is flowing across it. So you have to put it onto something where water is going past it, so it can get to that um get to that 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 um toxic ammonia. So sure. having it in your filtration is the best place to have it. Because all water is just flowing through it, where those little beneficial bacteria, the little Pac-Mans, can eat up all that bad stuff in the water that'll kill you, kill your fish. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's 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 a good way to put it. So, you know, let me. I'll just tack on something for it. So that's one of the things in the tank you don't want to wash out and clean. I guess is that is a good way if you have a hang on back now. If you've got an aquarium spot like a sponge filter, that's a little bit different. You're going to have to be a little bit more careful with it. When yeah. using it, you know how you're rinsing them and stuff. Like you don't want to be rinsing that with your tap water because you're just going to kill off your entire biological filter. So that's probably one of the, you know, a few downsides to to sponge filters, right? But that's you want to make sure that stays in there as much as possible. And your tank is going to go through what they call I call it swings. I think there's probably a better name for it. But if you just swings. set up a brand new tank, you know, you have different sw swings of ammonia or swings of nitrogen, however you want to say it. You're going to have a, a spike of ammonia and then your bacteria is going to, mom, 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 is going to eat it up, right? Then you've got this secondary, you know, ammonia that's in the tank and it's going to spike. And, you know, as long as you, if you're doing your water changes in the beginning, so I would say while you're setting up your tank, right, you should be doing, I think, at least a 20 to 25% water change a week during your initial yeah. month to, to yes. make it easier. Right. And the goal yes. is you're setting it up. You're trying to set yourself up for success to where after, once you get this cycle settled, you know, and barring nothing crazy happens, it's a lot less work in the end. Right. That's how yes. I try to explain it to people. So yeah. you get through the first spike, boom, uh, ammonia, and your second spike, you know, is nitrite boom. And once you get the nitrate, you know, nitrates really not toxic to fish. It can in high, high amounts, cause a lot more uh, algae growth, brown algae, things like that. Um, and then, you know, you'll just need to do a water change to get rid of that. And then I think you're good and there's not a lot to it. There's a few now, uh, and me and Jay have talked about this a few times. I don't know if we want to talk about this beginner podcast or in another one, but there's right. some, you want, you want to talk about Jay, the, the nitrifying bacteria. You want to talk about that or say that? Oh, okay. So I did a video <laughs> on this, this, there's products out there, and, and I'll go ahead because 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 I have to learn that these products are fairly new, in my opinion. I mean, mm. they probably was went around in small circles, but um, they're starting to take off. And and to be honest with you, 
Um, I kind of have to change my view on setting up your first tank because of these products, because they do work. Yeah. And, and, and what these products are is they're, you, 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 when you say the word cycle or swings and all that, when you're setting up your first aquarium, you have to learn about the, um, the um, nitrogen cycle, which all it is is learning about how water acts, you know, the, 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 the nature of water, um, with fishing it and feeding it and, and, you know, and all that stuff. And you have to know that. But when you're first starting out, you don't know it, right? You might get a brief, the guy at the pet store might give you a quickie little tutorial, but at the end of the day, he's just trying to get you out the doors with $300 worth of equipment. So yeah. you get it home and, and you don't know anything about it, but he also says, Hey, this is an instant cycle. So you don't have to learn too much about the nitrogen cycle because this makes it easy. The problem with this product is, is, is it works. It, 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 <laughs> it allows you to put your fish in immediately, which when I first started out, you had to wait weeks, depending on how big of a tank you had, before you put in your first fish. A yeah. first-time fish don't want to wait. They want the fish. I don't, wanna, I don't want a tank full of water in my house for weeks with nothing in it. People yeah. asking me what's in it. Um, so they, they have this stuff. And, you, and I mean, there's, there's Dr. Tim's, there's Fritz. There's, there's a couple out in the market. Um, where it's instant cycle where you go, you can do that. Now, the problem is with this is that while it does work, it's still cheating. You don't have to learn about the nitrogen cycle at yeah. first. But if you keep your aquarium successfully for any amount of time, you are going to run into issues where the knowledge that you would have gained at first the old way would come into play. Yeah. But being that you don't have that knowledge because you didn't go through that trial and error you're going to have issues about three, four months, five, six months down the line where you're not going to have the answer to a question that you would have had had you done it the old fashioned way. So while if, if beginners are watching this, there is a product on the market that will allow you to put fish in the first day. I don't suggest it for beginners. I suggest you set it up the old fashioned way and learn about how water acts um, so that when you do come across these issues later on, you know the answers. Now, if you already know about the cycle, um, about ammonia spikes, about nitrites and nitrates, if you already know about that, I, yeah, most definitely set every first tank up with it. I, I mean, I think I probably will probably do that for now on. Um, but starting out, I think it's dangerous. Yeah. Um, it, it makes it makes people. Um, it skips a huge important step in the hobby. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard. We live in uh, we live in the instant gratification world. We want yes. everything now, 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 now. I mean, I think I just ordered some more things on Amazon. It'll be here tomorrow. And I just, it's so hard for me to fathom that it's like, if it's not here tomorrow, it's almost like I'm upset. And I'm like, it, look, I can't. It's like forever. It's forever. It's like, I need, oh my God. Uh, I got to wait forever. one more day. Oh my gosh. And now, you know, it, you have a products out there that, that, cycle tanks faster and i will say i didn't know you know we've never used them here so we have a farm right we have a farm commercial operation here we never use much of them because we have we have all that already kind of built into our setup we you know been doing this a while and um uh, i was helping uh some kids set up tanks for the fair we have here and we had like eight tanks and we had some issues with filtration and i bought some of it i'm like well maybe this will help when we start introducing all this stuff with new water and everything and uh, my gosh, like there was no issues in those tanks. I mean, zero. And they were good um, with just minimal water changes for a good 14 days. And I'm like, wow, like that's insane how well they worked. And, um, you know, I'm not doing any product shout outs, but I used the Dr. Tim's one. And that was that was great. It worked out really well um, and did what we need to do. Brought them back, set them up. And uh, it was a cool, cool little thing. But uh it what it does i will agree with with uh, aquafong what it does is that uh you lack that knowledge when something goes wrong you won't know how to fix it um yeah. cuz a lot of people say oh my gosh your ammonia spike and what do you do you know and, and that's that entry level knowledge when you start with and you know when you're addressing that typically you're, there's two problems right when your ammonia spikes if there's a problem it could be either a you didn't do enough water changes or b you have too many fish so doing a water change ain't going to fix your problem you should know that you have too many fish and that's probably the biggest biggest thing you're going to see is like i can't get my ammonia to go down i can't get my nitrite to go down well 
you know, for the most of that, that could be that issue. So, yeah. All right. It's, All right. So, speaking yep. Yeah, nope. Can, can I add something? And and I don't know if this is a subject that you're going to bring up later on. If so, we, um, but <sighs> when picking out your first fish, and I'm going back to the fish. Uh, in your mind, when you're sitting at home and you're imagining that's where my fish tank is going to be right there, it's going to be that big, the fish is going to look like this. Yeah. When you go to the pet store and you buy the fish, you think to yourself, okay, I got a 55. I want a Jack Dempsey. And you, you go and you go, okay, uh, I want a Jack Dempsey. And they show you the Jack Dempsey and it's this big. And you think <laughs> to yourself, Okay, that's five dollars. I got plenty more room. Let me get the firebound. Let me get the Oscar. Let me get yep. the convicts. Let me get the set. So now you have a fully stocked tank at fifty a fifty five guy, but they're this big. Yeah. Now six months from now, they're not gonna be that big. No. So you no, do no, have no. a overstocked tank. You may not have it now, but you yeah. will be having it later on. So yeah. And that, that, you know, ammonia will happen. You know, that all goes from picking, being sure of what you want. So, yeah. Um, sometimes I, buying the cheap little fish ain't really worth it. Get the big fish. Yeah. And I guess the way I would, you know, just wrap up what you said is, you know, when you get your fish and you want to, you want to pick these fish out, take a picture ahead of what it looks like with the end in mind. How big are the fish going to yes. get? Are they going to get along yes. together? That sort of thing. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I think you'll do much better here in the hobby for sure. Yeah. 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 Otherwise you're going to have a lot of, you'd be like, why are my fish fighting all the time? Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> you'll, you'll save yourself a lot more money that way. Yeah. Cause you're going to have fish killing each other. Oh, you definitely, definitely are. Yeah. All right. So, we covered uh, tank, tank size, shape. We talked about filter. We talked about the nitrogen cycle. And this is something that I don't think it's talked about a lot, but I think it matters. And, and I don't want to, I'll lead to it a little bit, but I think it matters in terms of the overall environmental stress of the fish. And that is um, lights. And I'm going to ask you a question. Do you turn your tank lights off at night? Yes, I do turn my tank lights off at night. Um, Lights, lights is so difficult because, um, see, when you, if you have plans, I mean, there's so many variables when it comes to lights. You All know right. what I mean? So, so to keep it a little bit more pointed, mostly yeah. for fish, planted tanks, I think is a whole nother talk because that's a lot yeah. of, there's a lot going on with planted tanks, but mostly for like the fish itself. Do you think it's important for their well being? I guess is a good way to put it. No, I don't think lights are important for their well-being. Um, lights, in my opinion, are for me as the the guy who wants to see their fish in all yeah. their glory, you know, all their color. Um, ambient light from the room, as long as they could see their food when it's time for them being fed. But at the same time, I say that, but at the same time, as a fish keeper, um, picking out the right light is important because you want to continue admiring your fish, right? So you need to put a light on there because you're going to get bored with your fish is all you have is a dark tank all the time. So, But you have to keep in mind, just because you're putting a light on there, that don't mean you have to get a $300 light set up just to have fish. You, no. No, I mean, there's a whole lot of DIY aspects of lighting that I'm gonna be honest with you, I I bought a a um I bought a aquarium set, you know the kits from um, yeah. PetSmart. That's probably the first time I've paid for lights designated for aquariums in about four years. Yeah, I haven't bought in the last four years. I have never bought a light from a pet store or a fish tank. The only reason why I have that forty-five gallon light strip is because it came with it. Yeah, 
I'll give it. I'll give a, a funny example I've seen the last week or so. So in our shop here, we put up a, a little 20 gallon long with some community fish and mostly we were using it to shoot video. And on top of it was a light we've been debating on carrying in the store and kind of, um, and working and selling this light. It's a planted light, right? It's a really nice light. And yeah. I took some fancy guppies we had in our tanks and I put them in there. And on the other wall where our other like normal shop lights are, uh, is like a like a low Kelvin, like a 4,000 Kelvin, like a sunset looking bulb. It's like orangey tint. You know what I'm yeah. talking about on the rack over there. And yeah. the way the fish look on the low Kelvin one on the main rack, it looks like they have no color. I put them in that tank with that real nice light and the color is just the brightest. I mean, everyone's like, well, I want the fish out of this tank. Well, these are the same. No, 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 no. I want the fish out of the 20, uh, the, this gallon right here. I want that Japanese, yeah. you know, blue swordtail guppy or that yeah. golden cobra because they, the colors just pop um, yeah. Yeah. under the light. So it's not like, you know, there's tons of, you know, examples. You know, coming from industry, you do, I don't see these things as much until people, you know, point them out or I set them up. I'm like, oh my God, look how much yeah. better those fish yeah. look under that specific lighting condition. So I think it can matter. I don't think it has to be expensive by any means, but no. the different um, light intensities could change and make the color pop a little bit more in your tank. Can, uh, to be 100% honest, there's one aspect of lighting that I think beginners are looking for, but they don't realize they're looking for it. And, and in my opinion, it's honestly kind of difficult to do with aquarium designated lights. I find it real easy to do it with Home Depot. Yeah. Um, they called, they called um, LED um, work lights. They're little square lights, and they have like a little triangular base. You ever seen mm. them? Like the floodlights. You, you know what I'm, huh? Like the floodlights. Flood yeah. 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 They cost yeah. about $15, $20 at Home Depot with Lowe's. All yeah, right. they're nice. They're very intense. But if you put them on your the top of your tank and you run a air bubbler really high to where the top of the tank is 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 moving around, you get a huge shimmer. A hmm. really re I don't have it on this one. Um but you get a serious shimmer and I think that shimmer effect is what first timers are looking for. Yeah. Um, and, and they, they, they think if you spend the money and you get this light, um, you know, 300, but once they use the DIY, like whenever I, I show people tanks that I have that have that shimmer because of the, the, the they're, 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 they're like, Oh my God, look at it. You know? Uh, so I think the biggest thing, first timers, um, Oh, they always want the black lights too. As far as first time. Oh goes, yeah. Yeah. Black yeah. Lights, uh, which, um, like this, I have this is a night crew thing someone gave me. Yeah. So it does have that night, that nighttime, uh, what you would call it? That will grow algae also. And just, yeah. just because it's a black light, that doesn't mean it's not gonna grow algae. It is. Uh that top of that that plant will get algae when I keep that on. So just you know, something to think about. Yeah. And uh I know we talk about types of lights real quick, but I did want to mention um, just the length of the time your light stays on is also, I, I think that's probably maybe a little bit more important type of light, but the length of your light stays on. And I'll, I'll kind of talk about it in two points. One, you know, in, in my opinion, I think you should definitely have a time where your tank is on and your tank is completely off, like no blue light, like nothing. And I think it, yeah. it definitely matters to the fish because one, you should see I mean, most of the fish, you'll see them kind of resting at the bottom a lot of times when the lights come off. Like, you'll turn the light back on. Oh, they're all kind of resting at the bottom, right? They got to sort of recharge their own batteries. And um, I think that's, you know, for me, thinking about lights and, and time, and length of time you have it on, I think matters to the fish yeah. for sure, as far as like a stress level. Managing their stress and keeping as low as possible. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. As far as, as, far as tank um, light time, um, I tell people, you know what, six hours when you're home. Okay, so let, let's think about it. You got, you, let's say you have, you know, um, two parental figures, you know, a couple kids. They're going to school. The parental figures are at work. Um, there's nobody home. 
your light being on is just terrible because it's just creating all kinds of issues. Everybody gets home about 530. That's when the light should cut on, you know? Yeah. Um, and especially if you have kids, like when my living room tank, um, I'll use a timer and the light will go off the same time. And that's when my daughter knows it's time for bed. And oh, I tell people awesome. that, you know, I tell them that, hey, get a timer for your lights, six hours or less, depending on when people are home. Yeah. And use the tank light as a, a bedtime alarm. You know, that's and, and awesome. It, it, you know, it, it, I feel like that'd be the best thing, especially if you have kids in the house. You know, oh, tank lights out. You know, it's time to start ready for bed. So, um, yeah. Yeah. No, I really liked that. I didn't think about that as much. I'm like, oh, man, like, you know, timers was going to be something I talked about. But if you got kids using that, I'm like, oh, lights off, time to go to bed. Man, I don't know how you beat that as like a as a constant recurring, you know, keep, keeping kids in. I mean, you know, you got to keep kids in routine, man. If they don't, they get out of that yes. routine. They are yes. all they are yes. all over the place, man. I got a little one. Yes. She's got a routine and that's just the way she she's got to she's got to stay with it. And routine, honestly, like you, you, you touched on doing weekly water changes. We're talking yeah. about light cycles, um, you know, time. To, and, and you, you kind of hit the nail on the head. Um I find that aquariums, water, fish, all that is very forgiving if you keep it in a routine. Yeah. You feed them the same. You feed them the same. You do the water changes the same amount once a week all the time. You keep the light on for the same amount of time, cutting off it. And, and, and the natural – nature's natural ability to regulate itself will – kind of meet you halfway so yeah routine and consistency is huge huge you know as far as aquariums go yeah so that was going to lead me into the next section was maintenance you know how how long and how often you think you do it you know on that sort of note mm -hmm. especially when you're starting out if you can keep you know like jay like Aquafung says keep that routine if you can do that water change weekly especially doing you know, what, once the cycle has been established, if you're doing, I think 20%, 25% is probably not overdoing it. And to be honest, I don't like to do more than that. If there's a lot of, you know, anytime you're introducing a big change into your tank and you're doing have to do a massive water change, you, yeah. you know, it, listen to this temperature matters a lot in your fish tank, anything over a couple degrees can, it doesn't always, but can cause what they call thermal stress on the fish. So if you're thinking you need to do a 50% water change, daily now mind you uh, this is for the bulk of all fish if you're up there advanced hobbyist keeping discus this is not for you this is not what i'm talking about just so we're clear yeah, yeah. that's a different talk for sure but for the most you know everyday fish keeper when you start dropping the water temperature in these tanks doing huge water like if you got to do a huge water change that's fine but if if everything seems to be going well and your tank's clean i don't think it's necessary to do that big a water change and i think you could be doing more more harm than good for sure. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, like you talking about the temperature of the water where you do a water. First of all, I, my ideal water change is 25 or one third percent every week, but that number changes for every tank at every house, depending on how many fish you have in there. Oh, you know, for um, sure. For sure. If you don't, if you have a whole bunch of itty bitty little fish, and you're and you have a nice amount of um fish that will eat at every level for instance you have snails you have quarry cats you have um placos you, you probably are not gonna have you let's say you have some crayfish or some shrimp something to dig in the rocks get that food out of the rocks you're probably not gonna have a whole lot of extra food which with the extra food you're gonna have water changes are important um, now, if you have a big old Oscar just dropping bombs, you know, um, yeah, you know, it, it, it depends. So water changes are different for everybody. I suggest start at, um, you know, 25% once a week, um, but also monitor. You may have to do one third once a week. Um, you may could get away with doing 25% every two weeks. It depends. That's where you have to know about ammonia and bacteria and all that stuff. Um, another thing, if you are doing large water changes, like I breed angels, um, so I feed heavy. The more I feed, the more they poop, the more I need to clean the water. Um, 
I do large water changes, but I do not clean my filters, the sponge filters, every time. I I will I will stagger like oh I'm doing a large water change I'm gonna leave my filter nice and dirty with all that beneficial bacteria and all that stuff because you know I may get some spike or something you know what I mean so I try and keep balance um, dirty water uh, a whole lot of clean water dirty filter um, a, a clean filter not so much you know you know on the water changes um, but. These are all things you have to figure out for yourself as a first timer, and um, it, it, it's going to take some time. So it's some trial and error because every tank is different. Yeah, and I think just to kind of wrap that up. You know, this goes back to doing the due diligence when you're setting up your tank. The more fish yeah. you want to put in one single tank, the more maintenance and work you're kind of making for yourself. Essentially, yeah. you know, you've got a it's a it's a it's a delicate balance of you know, amount of fish or what we call bio load versus the amount of filtration and water changes you're going to need to balance that out. And it's just, it's just a scale and making sure those things balance out can, you know, can be challenging, but it doesn't have to be, you know, and you just kind of match what you feel like doing to the amount of fish you want to put in the tank, you know, back in the, you know, I don't know. Yeah. And this, this goes back to the, you know, the very first thing when you get your first aquarium, you know, what are you thinking about? I say, you got to, figure out what fish you want. Now, what happens is, this is what happens in most cases when I was working at the LFS. They come, they really wanted something else, but they didn't know that yet because they haven't been in a hobby long enough to realize they wanted something else. Um, they they buy an aquarium, they find a 20-gallon on sale, you know. Um, they think they want a community tank. No. So they get all these fish for the community tank, but as time goes on, they realize I don't know. I, I kind of want, you know, I want to get into some of these, uh, these, uh, these Central and South Americans, or 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 anything else, or or like Garami. They they find out they want, so they end up getting more fish, because they realize no 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 these are the fish I want. So they start throwing those in there. So now you have fish you don't want mixed in with the new fish that you do want, now you have a huge bio load issue. Um, so yeah, water changes at that point is very crucial. Yeah. Which if, if you knew ahead of time what you was getting, you'd probably get an idea of how much water changes you're going to have to do. That's, yeah. that's something we have to do. I, yeah, I definitely think, you know, that go, you know, goes back to the planning section. So I think as long as you're, yeah going through the steps and the motions and be like, I need to make the, you make sure this is a good setup or go. I would hopefully, hopefully you could ask your local LFS, you know, for some advice or maybe yeah. go look at some forums, jump in some Facebook groups, things like that. And uh, ask those questions. So is this a good idea? What is people's experience? Try to lay out, try to go to people that's already done that and had that experience yeah. and, and, and kind of bounce some ideas off them for sure. And to be honest with you, I, I used to really enjoy working at the pet store where customers would start having their own little powwows and making decisions that way. Like, for instance, you know, a customer would be looking at a certain fish and they ask another customer, oh, what kind of fish? Should, how, what do you think about that? And then they'd have their own little – they would learn so much from the other customers that maybe have a little bit more experience who just went through that, you know, and they go, oh, you know what, babe? I don't want Tetris. I want Garamis. Yeah. They don't get as big, but they're still, you know, yeah. but they, they, they realize that. And it's it's a little bit more um, uh, uh, easier for them to digest when it's coming from another person instead of an employee. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, so, for sure. Yeah. All right. So we kind of covered, I think we covered everything on setting up your first aquarium as far as I can see, but air, I wanted to say it again, food, air and food. Oh, we didn't talk about food. That's what I didn't put in here. So let's, let's go ahead and talk about food. Cause that's, that to me is probably outside of filtration, the most important yeah. topic out there. So I guess I'll Used. stage it with, um, how often should you feed your fish? How often should you feed your fish? That is, uh, <laughs> you, ask, you, ask, you ask 100 people, you get 100 different answers. You are definitely um, going to get a lot of answers on this. Uh, 
I'm gonna be honest with you. Uh, I I feel like that how often you feed your fish can only be answered by you as the uh, fish keeper. Me personally, I feed my fish every day. But like I said, I got something going on. I feed my fish multiple times a day because I'm feeding them heavy for breeding. Um, yeah. So that's that's just me. But for a hobbyist, depending on what type of fish they have, you know, um, the the size of the, the the type of filtration they have that has to do with, you know, are you feeding them flakes where the flakes just shoot all over the place and get sucked up by the filtration? Well, then the fish aren't eating. Do you have fish at the top that eat the food faster than they than it could get to the bottom? There's a whole lot of things. Um, I tell people. The best way to answer any of your questions on how to feed your fish is to observe all your fish's bellies. If all your fish's bellies are either straight across with a slight, a slight curve, then you're good. You're feeding them enough. If they are concaved inward, they're not eating enough. They don't have enough food. Or if they're bulged out too much. Um Fish can actually go days without food. Yeah. Um, but if you're if you're get if you go to the store and you get yourself a little one inch fish and you're waiting for it to get eight inches, you might want to try and feed them every day um, and keep their stomach slightly bulgy so that they can hurry up and grow so you can get that effect that you was looking for. But keep in mind, more food, more poop, more water changes. Hundred percent. Yeah, I was thinking about this. Uh, actually, I was doing a talk not too long ago about some things. You know, I try to take what we've done in the industry and I and I try to apply it and say what what it, what have we done that's been most successful? And outside of the most the times you feed a day, because that's different. We, I'm, I guess I'll talk a little bit about diet. So here we feed a mixture of both dry and frozen foods. Um, we don't do as many live for um, disease issues, right? But we're using a lot of frozen, a lot of Hakari frozen foods, to be honest. Shout out to Hakari. But um, to give you an idea, when we bring in fish as a wholesaler, we're bringing in large lots. I mean, Jay, you've been here. You've seen it a couple times. We bring in, you know, guppies. We've got yeah. 500 in a bag. Um, yeah. They're coming from Sri Lanka. It's a 72-hour time by the time yeah. they leave there, not even including the time they got to the exporter. You're talking just flight time. When they get here, they're going to be, you know, this is across the board and, you know, the transparency side, you're going to have some stressed out fish. We found yeah. that when you feed um, the the frozen foods to those fish, it elicits a different response out of them and it, it gets them out of that, that low stress exhaustion level to where they're active, they're eating, and they'll just destroy everything you're going to eat. So we use the food to aid in anything anytime your fish are feeling sick, right? Feeling a little stressed out or they're not acting normal. And then, but yeah. we also do it to keep their, you know, sort of gut, you know, not eating the same thing all the time, right? You eat the same thing over and over, your, your gut's going to get used to it. You're not going to get everything out of it. You should, right? You keep it, I don't know, kind of guessing is a good way, like an analogy to put yeah. it. So we feed them a little mix of frozen, a little mix, a little bit of dry food. Um, uh -huh. Uh, it's typically interchanging. So one day we'll feed dry, one day we'll feed frozen or every other, you know, or we'll mix in the frozen three times a week, whatever the, you know, formula is we're going to use for that week. And we're, we're still testing. It's not, this is not something that's set in stone. We just know we mix it in throughout the week and yeah. uh, we find our health, our fish are just super like a lot more healthy. Like you'll see they'll be bigger. There'll be a little slight yeah. bulge to them. It'll help them just kind of get from, you know, point A to point B. So at least yeah. they're, everyone's getting a, a healthy and happy fish. Hmm. And I, I think it's funny how you – I don't think it's funny. I think it's actually pretty cool how you, you're over here um, noticing that um, when, when he says frozen, basically he's saying they were alive, whether it be worms or brine hmm. shrimp, and they froze it. So it's, 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 not, it's not living anymore. Um, Correct, yes. <laughs> changes, changes – because I had some wild um, autumn angels that – that um, I put them in the tank and they they hid. They were very very skittish. Mm. Um, and I thought to myself, how can I get these fish to come out? Um, and I was like, well, maybe if I put some dither dither fish in there. Which if, for people who don't know what dither fish is, they're just a smaller fish that swims 
And what happens is, especially um, bigger fish in the wild, they will look for those little fish to be swimming on top. Because if those little fish are swimming on top, that means it's safe for them to come out. You know, if the little sm smaller fish book, well, then, hey, something's wrong. They hide. So I was like, let me try and put some dither fish in there. And I went with um, mollies, which the dither fish never really did anything. What did it was the mollies having babies. Mm. Angels <laughs> are, are cichlids. Yeah. So it kind of brought that little natural predator having to chase these little babies um uh. and 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 it's just weird how different types of food can elicit different reactions um you know whether it be the predatory action you know response or or you know whatever um another thing i wanted to talk about with food especially for beginners because um if you're not if you're a beginner and you're not getting a community tank you're probably getting a predator predatory tank and you probably saw your buddy drop a whole bunch of live feeders in there. And that was like, oh, I got to have that tank. I got to have that fish. And, and, and uh, here, here's the problem with live feeders. Um, live feeders is a business. The people who make live, fit, live fish, rosy reds, guppies. Um, um, ghost shrimp. Uh, ghost shrimp, uh, goldfish. They, they, they're... It's a business, so they 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 need to hurry up, grow these fish up, send as many as they could, and get as much as they can back. In yeah. the process of doing that, they're not kept under the best conditions. So you have illnesses, um, fish that are ba basically brought up on foods that encourage quick growth and not necessarily healthy growth. So when you feed these fish to your to your predatory, whether it be Oscar, Jack Dempsey, Mimbunas, wh whatever you have, um, you're you're running the risk of introducing some really bad stuff to your tank. I'm not going to say don't do it. I'm not going to say do not feed your fish live. I'm not because, I mean, I'd lie to you if I said I don't kind of find it interesting. Oh, he got him. You know, um, but what I will say, if you do it, you need to think way in advance and get yourself a quarantine tank, especially for feeders, or raise your own feeders yourself, um, which kind of takes a lot of the spont spontaneous out of it. You know, you got to go to the store, get yourself some feeders, put them in a tank, medicate them, let them sit there for a week or two before they're healthy enough to feed your fish. Then you have to feed those fish, those feeder fish, something um, – nutritious because you want your bigger fish to get whatever they ate. So when it comes to feeders, I, I don't suggest buy them from places that sell feeders too much. I mean, I'm not saying they all, all places do it, but you don't know which ones do or don't. So I would suggest either raise your own feeders, buy yourself a whole bunch of guppies and mollies and just raise your own or uh, feed frozen. Yeah. I, that's my best advice for that. Yeah. And if you think about it, so every single feeder fish out there is all raised in ponds outdoors for the most part. You're not raising a whole, you're doing, you know, ghost shrimp are typically wild caught here in Florida, right? They're local lakes or whatever. Um, here, the guppies are all raised in big earthen ponds. Your rosy reds are raised overseas um, in big, high intense cultures. So anytime you're bringing anything from a, a natural like environment, either a pond or it's something wild out of, you know, the Amazon, anytime you're introducing those things into your aquarium, you better be quarantining that tank before you do anything, because you could be introducing, because when they're out there, they, they're going to have a lot of things. Having imported a lot of fish from other countries that have been wild, especially out of central and South America and other places, you're going to have, disease issues at some point or another and having a, you know, maybe I, I think quarantine tanks, a whole separate topic. Um, that's a lot. Quarantine, to look, that's a whole I lot. Was of just, <laughs> I was just about to say that. I was like, Oh, here we go. Quarantine and acclimating fish is a whole different. <laughs> that's, that's a whole different. Uh, that's that's gonna another be episode two. Three hours. Yeah. That's another that's two, three two. and four. Yeah. yeah. That's a lot. <laughs> But, but just um, for the just for the feeder fish, you know, that's why I agree with Jay. If, if you're new, set it up. Don't feed any feeders right off the bat. Do some frozen foods. But, um, 
do some of those to start with because you know you're not introducing new pathogens at that point it's been yeah. killed off at some level but for that we'll we'll kind of leave the that topic there for a little bit and yeah. then uh i think we'll it'll we'll kind of lead into some of the myths you know truths yeah. you know true or false is what do you think uh, in, in the industry if you're good with that I am, right. but can I get into one topic that I don't think a lot gets a lot of, of recognition yeah. when it comes yeah. to setting up an aquarium? Um, air, aeration in an aquarium. Yeah. If you're just setting up a new tank, you're probably going to overstock it because you're excited. You got <laughs> the first time to live. You want more. Every time you do that, you, you deplete the oxygen. You know, there's only but so much oxygen in the, in the water. Um, and the way the oxygen gets in the water is not by, I don't know, you can't see them, but it's not by those big old bubbles that are shooting up from the bottom of your tank. That's not how your oxygen gets there. The oxygen gets there from the surface of the water being agitated, um, which allows micro microscopic air bubbles to be introduced to the water. Can't see them. They're there where the fish's gills can go grab them. If your tank is too hot, you have less. It, it doesn't allow oxygen to, to to flow freely. If you feed overfeed your fish, it causes ammonia. It's not necessarily the ammonia that kills your fish. Is that ammonia is an oxygen blocker? So the ammonia that's what come when you see a high ammonia, your fish are gasping for air because they can't get air because the, the ammonia is stopping it from coming. Too many fish, they're all fighting for the same oxygen. So um, when you're looking at filters, um, one that makes the water splash around a lot at the top is actually a very, very good thing also. Um, the more splashing at the top, the more oxygen to your tank. So that's yeah. the one thing that I don't think gets enough um, discussion. And that oxygen helps the fish's um, circulatory system, and they're healthier. So that's all I have to say. Yeah, no, yeah, and uh, and if you think about it, you know, obviously the fish need oxygen, but your biofilter also needs oxygen. So yeah. if you don't yeah. have enough oxygen in your tank for you know whatever reason, if that yeah. dies off, you can guarantee your whole tank's about to crash because it's gone, and yeah. you'll notice it. Yeah. You you'll have a small window to catch it because your fish are all going to be at the surface. They're hanging near the closest yeah. water outlet or the closest bubbler. Yep. And you've got a very small window to fix that problem. And you're going to have to do some massive things to fix it. But at least if you can see it, you know, they're gulping at the surface. They're hanging near the water outlets. You might, you might be able to catch it in case you run into that problem. Which that could be another video too. Emergencies. That's a whole, fish, yeah. Emergencies. Fish emergencies. Man, I like that. <laughs> I like one. that. Hey, you, yeah. We doing that. Just so, so we, just so you aware. <laughs> I'm cool with it. I'm cool with it. All right, All right, myths. Let's talk about these myths. All right. And uh, we talked about this. You talked about this briefly, but I wanted to elaborate a little bit more on it um, now and kind of dive into it a little bit. So um, one of the biggest, biggest myths I, I've always heard is overfeeding your fish is always better than underfeeding your fish. And I just, so that is just a hundred percent false. You don't, oh. you don't want to do that. It's going to create so many problems, but I'll let, I'll let you go answer first, but don't, you yeah, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, listen, yeah, that that's completely wrong. Overfeeding your fish yeah. is probably the number one cause of first time failure in an aquarium. Uh, uh, the first time hobbyist, the yeah. number one, um, because, um, you're just now learning about ammonia and nitrite, nitrates, and, and you overfeed your fish uh, because, you know, hey, everybody wants to feed the fish in the house, right? So as they walk past the tank, they just grab the bottle, sprinkle, sprinkle, and then the mom does it, and then the cousin, the next door neighbor, everybody feeding the fish. If people come over the house, you want to, hey, look at these guys, sprinkle, sprinkle. Yep, All you're yep. doing is dirtying your tank. And either you got to immediately change the water. And when I, I'm saying, I know you'd be like, not immediately, bro. There's been times where I've overfed my tank and thought to myself, ah, it'll be all right. And I noticed the very next day I had cloudy water. Um, mm. That's because I did, I did have a nice cycle going on. I did the same thing all the time. 
Then I added a twist by adding a whole lot of water, a whole lot of food to the water, and it threw the cycle off. Overfeeding a fish, a fish can go a long time without eating. If your fish are small enough, they are actually, actually, and you have, let's say, for instance, driftwood or live plants, just for instance, there's also microscopic things going on in there that your fish are also eating on. You know, they could be bunching on algae. There's, it, as long as their, their bellies, like I said, are either straight with a slight bulge, you're good. You're good. They can go weeks without eating. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I mean, I see it. I see it. I, I see it a lot when people come in, they're asking these questions. I'm like, well, how much, what are you feeding? I'm asking, what are they feeding? How often are they feeding? How much are they feeding? And they, they can show me and I'm like, oh yeah, you're, you're feeding too much. And you know, if, if you are feeding too much and you notice it and there's a bunch sitting on the bottom, just take, take about five minutes. And you know, if it's a flake or a pellet, just kind of dip it up and get it out of the tank. So it's not sitting there when it, Cause that food's just going to break down into ammonia and you're just adding it to your tank and your yeah. tank might, you know, like you said, might not be able to handle that extra load. And that's when the, cause all it's going to end up doing is creating more work for yourself. And that's, yeah. that's what, you know, to enjoy the hobby. I hate to say it. I want it yeah. to be easy. I want to find easy. the best, yes. the best, yeah. most efficient way that takes the least yeah. amount of time where I can enjoy yes. my tank. Like thank you. The tank yeah. you see behind me, I'll be honest. My, my wife scaped it. Um, and we set it up a few, uh, I don't know how many, how many days ago, weeks ago, whatever it was, I think it was like a week ago. Now she set it up. Um, but, um, it's in that initial stage, right? So it's still going through its, it's cycling and whatnot and, and going through that. But we, you know, obviously had some media already, already done, but you know, if it got dirty or I overfed the tank, cause I can still do it. You know, it's not, I'm not, you know, yeah. you know, I've been doing this forever. I'm still going to make that mistake. I'll just yeah. boop, boop, dip it up real quick. Cause I'm not trying to scrub the glass every single day because I added too much back to it, man. That's a, that's a lot. I ain't, I ain't about that life. <laughs> I'll do it if I got to because I want it to look nice. Yeah. But man, I'm not trying to. I, I gotta, I gotta make it right. If that makes yeah. sense. All right, yeah. let's uh, let's go on to the to the next one. So um, I hear this a lot, and there might have been some partial truth down the road, but I don't think for the most part, this applies to anything now, I guess that I've seen uh, fish only grow to the size of their aquarium. That, what do you think? That's false. They, 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 <laughs> they okay. So the fish are still going to grow, but they're going to be uh, in, in kind of a bad shape, you know, um, that's, <sighs> And that's that's because see now you're going into proper aquarium size per fish, right? You know, inch inch per gallon and all. Oh man, don't um, talk about that. Just keep it. Uh, you be simple. Yeah, just give a simple. Okay. It's gonna be. It's gonna be a lot. It, 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 in in most cases, they're talking about fish that grow large. You know, like nobody's gonna think that a guppy, if you put in a fifty five, is gonna get this big. You know what I mean? Right, but right. A fish that does, get, you know, uh, South American red tail cats. That, you you get them small, right? Oh, they're fine. Yeah, I can, I can put a South American red tail cat in my in my know, thirty five, my thirty gallon tank, my twenty nine. Yeah. That that and, fish ain't staying that size. You, yeah. Before they honestly, because of the fish that will grow so big in a small aquarium, I think you would have um, uh, them die from water issues before they died of. Uh, yeah being deformed because that fish is going to produce so much ammonia in such a small space. It would be impossible to keep up with it. But a fish, if you put a fish like an Oscar in a 10 gallon, he's going to continue to grow. He might not, he will not grow as big as he could, but he will have serious, serious deformations and health issues. Definitely. Um, due to dirty, dirty water, just inactivity. Um, it's going to be all kinds of that's yeah. a, that's a false. false. All right. And then I'll, I'll wrap up with this one. Cause I think we've talked about it before and there's, um, this could be, I don't want this. It might be a little controversial, but, uh, there's only one right way to do anything in this hobby. There's only one right way to do everything. Pick a filter, pick a tank. There's only one thing you can do. That's it. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna surprise <laughs> you with this one. I'm gonna surprise you with this one. <laughs> yes, there's only one right way. The only the right way for you, the right way for you is the only way that should be done. 
Um, yeah. The right way for you is not the right way for me. Is not the right way for somebody else. Um, so <laughs> I, I threw you a curve <laughs> in there. I like um, that. I like that. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's a bunch of ways to do a bunch of different things. And, and one of the things, it, it's false. There's many different ways to do things. Uh, many different filtrations, many different fish, many different scenarios, many different, there's many different period. Yeah. And, and I mentioned this a little bit. One of the things that I love about keeping aquariums is the mother nature's aspect of it. Um, one of the things that I always found fascinating when I first started out was when I worked at the LFS, we, we, we had salt water and, um, the salt water, the coral, the live coral would come in buckets and in shipment, those buckets would bang across, bang against oh, each other man, and yeah. pieces of, piece of it would fall at the bottom of the bucket. So when you took the live rock or the corals and you put them in the tanks at the buckets, you had this, 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 this mix of stuff. And I, I, I did an experiment at the pet store because I was curious. I took a small gallon, small, I think it was like 10 gallon two salt water setups and I put one bucket in one and put it actually it was both the same stuff. So, um, and I put it, you know, so it was the same stuff. These two tanks in different spots of the, of the store grew differently. Hmm. They grew differently. Um, some had a little bit more light because they were next to some different types of fish and one didn't have as much light because it was a little in the dark and one was a little bit warmer than the other. Um, it, it was, it was Mother Nature has a has a has a, a, a tendency to figure it out. All you have to do is not make it hard. So if if you have um if you do things one way, you know, Mother Nature will meet you halfway. You know, if you're not doing it exactly like somebody else, Mother Nature will make it work, you know. So no, there's there's so many variables. And life is going to want to live. It's going to want to be successful. You just have to not mess it up, you know. So, And most time people mess things up um, trying to be too helpful. Um, but there's a lot of different ways to do a lot of different things. And Mother Nature can handle all of them, in my opinion. Unless yeah. you're putting bleach in the water, you know. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good way to kind of kind of – you know, start wrapping up here for a little bit, but I definitely think there's a lot of different ways you can do things. I think, yeah. you know, I've met a lot of people in the hobby. There's a lot of great people in this hobby too, that are super act. They're very helpful. They can help you get started. Yeah. They'll answer the questions, but uh, you might ask five different people get five different answers and that's okay. Yeah. That worked for them and that's working for them currently. Right. So yeah. I, I don't want to take nothing away from anybody. You know, I'm, these are, you know, our opinions, what's worked for us with some, you know, yeah. science back, you know, some facts behind it. And then if you want to tweak it, move it around, do it, see if it works for you and then make your own, make it your own. There's so many different things you can do. Just yeah. kind of take it and uh, run with it. So yeah. I guess what I'll do is I'll kind of give you, um, I, I guess I'll call it like final thoughts. You know, what do you think? Anything else you want to mention about the topic uh, to anybody else that maybe we didn't talk about and then um, we'll go from there. No. Okay. So, to, to people out there that are first got their first aquarium and they're watching this video because you know they want to get some you know helpful tips on their first aquarium um observe your fish you might you know you might be able to call up this person you might be able to google that you might be able to at the end of the day you're the best person to make any decisions on the tank because you're the one that observing it you know um don't give up and, and be patient, you know, but, but as far as advice on your aquarium, as long as you know, the, the, um, the nitrogen cycle, which is very important. Um, I, I would imagine Dan is going to do a video on that specifically. Um, <laughs> yeah. you know, the nitrogen <laughs> cycle, you're, you're, um, being, um, um, consistent with your water changes, consistent with your feeding, um, you know, consistent, which feeding at the same time, um, your fish are going to be all right. You know, they're going to be all right. Uh, you just have to observe. You have to observe. Take time to observe. Yeah. Yeah. That's really all I have to say. I mean, that was literally, I I'm, I was, I had it all planned. I mean, I'm like, this is what I'm going to say. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, Jay said that. So, I, I mean, I was just going to say, just be consistent. 
be consistent with what you're doing. If you need to log it, you know, write down what's going on. You know, what do you see? What do you observe in the tank? Because that's half the fun of the hobby. How do you see the fish interacting with things? Is it different from day to day? Did you notice those things? Because it's those, I hate, you know, I hate to say it. Those are the things that I missed a lot you know, the whole time I've been in this, you know, industry, the little things I didn't pick up on. If I would have caught them, I would have saved me so much hassle with dealing with them later down the road. And I could pick up on if I, if I would have caught them, you know, I would have caught, you know, it before it really came on. I would have caught any bacterial infections. I would have caught, you know, the water not being changed properly. Cause there was a yeah. no air coming out of the sponge filter. The water hasn't been filtered yeah. in three days. Cause I didn't catch it. And you know, yeah. that's still a thing we have. Oh my gosh. Um, I don't know, 130 different kinds of fish at any given time. We have another building going up with, you know, 200 tanks, another green, like that's a lot of, you know, looking at the details of everything. And, you know, it, it's mm -hmm. something to definitely, you know, definitely look at the details, I guess is a good thing yeah. I would say. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, cool, man. Man, I had so much fun. I've never done this before. A lot of good, a lot of good content, a lot of good info. And um, I did want to mention if you want to reach out to Jay and uh, see his channel, I'll put all of his uh, contact info and links in the description below. So definitely reach out, subscribe to his channel. He's got, I will say, in a non biased opinion, he is one of my favorite YouTubers to watch for fish because he's, it's energetic, it's always fun. He makes different clips to keep it, you know, uh, yeah. keep you, you know, kind of stuck to it because you want to see it. And uh, I think you guys are going to really like it. So definitely do that. I would appreciate that support for sure. Yeah. All right, man. Well, thanks so much. I appreciate it. And uh, I'll see you guys next time. Later. <laughs>